Welcome back. I hope everybody had a fantastic time during the market listening to the pitches from the individual teams. Um, I spent my time actually speaking to every single one of the teams as opposed to um, going to the podium. And uh, I have to say, I was absolutely astounded at the level of ingenuity that was displayed by some of the teams. It's just amazing. So uh, I've got to say, everyone, you should give yourselves a round of applause. I think that was really great what you've done today. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> And of course, uh, I should also point out that the online voting system is now closed. So that vote is now locked in, and we'll find out later on who has won that particular award. Now, before we get on to the award ceremony, we're going to have a nice talk about, well, well what is Biosensors going to do for us and where Biosensors is going to go? And the speaker is Zanya Kayet. She has a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Toronto and specialized in consultancy for healthcare innovation. Currently, she is on secondment from Toronto, Canada to the Reshape Health Innovation Center at the Randbond University Medical Center in Nijmegen. And today, she's going to give us a talk about the future of health and how sensors will help. Please give a round of warm applause for Zania Pella. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Wow, what great energy, just even walking here, the balloons and the red. Um, I love being in this space. I even wore my innovation shoes for you guys today just to fit, just to fit in. So, um, so look, I'm going to tell you kind of my perspectives on where healthcare is going and then, uh, and then where these sensors you're all coming up with might fit in getting us there. So you guys might know the Polish astronomer, Nicholas Copernicus, so in the 1500s, using just math, he was pretty sure he figured out that the world had it wrong, the Earth is not the center of the universe, um, uh, and you know, the sun is just with Saturn and all the others rotating around it, but actually the sun is the center, and the Earth is just one of many. Um, he was put in jail for that. When he published his paper, he couldn't put his name on it, because the paradigm of the time was that the Earth is the center. Uh, it wasn't until 100 some years ago later that Galileo made it indisputably clear that uh, the paradigm was wrong. Because a paradigm's like a map, right? It shapes how we think. If I want to go from here to there and I have the wrong map, I'm not going to get there. So we've designed healthcare around a paradigm, which is what we knew at the time when we built medicine, 100, 150 years ago, and we're trying to produce health, and the map just isn't quite getting us there. So if you've read Thomas Kuhn's thinking about, uh, he kind of observed all these paradigm shifts over time, and the pattern is whatever is the dominant science of the time, the central paradigm, starts to kind of feel wrong, kind of like what Copernicus experienced. And then science really revolutionizes things, uh, and then you can't go back. Once you know what you know, you can't go back, and the paradigm shifts. Um, and that's kind of what's going on with healthcare. So I call it our Copernicus moment. So when we built healthcare, you know, patients were too stupid to get involved in this complex biology of their own body. We trained people very heavily, and we concentrated all the places where you get this very complicated service in these large places called hospitals. Uh, and so we designed the whole system around the system, right? And the patient is just kind of out there uh, and, and getting the services on the side. Well, there's some revolutionary science happening that's kind of pushing that paradigm to a new paradigm. And I really summarize it as three big forces. And we haven't had these three forces come together in the way they have until literally this moment in time. So one is our health system actually can't afford uh, to keep giving care the way it has for the demand of the population, right? If you think before when we designed healthcare, if you got sick, you either died or you got better. There's no staying alive with four diseases. There was no staying alive after you've had cancer for 20 years. So our, our ability to pay is, is strained, but that's always been the case. Every healthcare system in the world for 25 years, the headline was, we can't afford the demand as the population ages and stays alive with lots of diseases. So that wasn't enough to tip the paradigm. The second big domino is that we've woken up 
as patients, as consumers, as family members. Like in every other thing in our life, we have access to all the data, all the information is right here, and we're empowered to do something about it. So many of you are young, but I remember the days when if I wanted to get money out of the bank, I had to get on a bus and only go to the bank for the two hours that the human teller was there to give me my money. If I ran out on the weekend, I can't go out because <laughs> there's no way to get the cash. Travel booking, every other service that was quite labor, consumers have taken control and healthcare is next. And I'll talk about that a bit more. But that's not even enough. Even if we want good health care and we're out of money, um, we couldn't do anything about it until the third one, and that's where you come in. We now have technology and tools to do something about it that's accessible, affordable, and democratized. And that's this kind of perfect storm that's pushing us to a new paradigm where the, the patient's in the center. So where do you come in? Well, I'm going to kind of unpack what this shift to the future is gonna look like. I kind of break it into six dislocations or shifts, and let's look at each one of them and see where sensors might help us go a little bit faster. So the first big shift, and I saw it a little bit in some of the groups out there, is the timing of when we place or provide healthcare services or interventions, right? So remember, when we designed our system, it was designed to react, to wait. So some people say that's not a health care system, it's a sick care system because it was designed to solve big problems when there's an emergency. We know we can't keep doing that. We can't keep reacting because we know the sickness is coming. So lots of pushing upstream, prevention, uh, proactive health, and most importantly, what we call predictive health care. So what does this look like? Well... The left bar is what drives health, what causes health. If I had a sensor that could take the barometer of this whole room and what makes you healthy and why, only for about 3% of you um, is the, the result, the status of your health, the result of medical care you've received. Our big, beautiful, fancy healthcare system actually doesn't drive that much health in, in, in a population. What really drives it is pretty much the postal code into which you were born. Your poverty rate, the literacy rate of you and your family, your exposure to violence, air quality, all these things which lead to behaviors around smoking, around eating, around alcohol, around sleep, and around stress. And that drives 70, 80% of health and it intermingles with your genetic background. Um, yet if you flip the chart and you look at where we spend our healthcare dollars, so I'm from Canada, we spend about 200 a billion dollars of healthcare, about 13% of our GDP. The Netherlands is like 95 billion. The US is a couple trillion. 90% um, of it is on sick care, right? So you can see how this can't be sustainable. So if you think of your whole health span from when you're born and you're healthy and you're well and you're productive in society and you're paying taxes, that's why we want people to be healthy so they can be working and contributing to the tax base. Um, medicine, this word medicine, only comes in when things go wrong. If there's a symptom or a risk and you need to get a diagnosis and then a treatment and a little bit of monitoring. But health is the whole thing, okay? Really dangerous to use those two words interchangeably. And we've had a medical model of health. And those days are kind of numbered. That's this big shift. So if you imagine, if this was uh, your health span, let's say the example you guys all had of a cardiac event that led to some situation, we've got a couple of different ways today that we try to stop that from getting bad. One is public health. Sodium rules about food, bike lanes, walking lanes, public swimming and that kind of thing. And that might stop some of it, but it's not gonna get it all. There's a lot more going on in people's lives that leads them to have the behaviors that lead to poor health in the heart. And so traditional medicine comes in when things have really hit the fan. But all this data about you is, is being generated every day. Every one of you, whether you want it or not, has an avatar of yourself being created of all the patterns of what you do, your social, your movements, your biochemical, your biophysiological, et cetera. And now there's a ton of innovation happening way, way earlier on predictalytics and advanced algorithms based on early signals. So what would this look like if it was a sensor? Well, I don't know if you've 
any of you have known anybody with cancer, usually you find out you have cancer when there's some kind of a tumor. Either you feel it or there's a symptom. It's pressing on something. And then the first thing they do is biopsy it to make sure and check if it actually is uh, cancerous. So here's a typical biopsy. Usually they have to have the ultrasound at the same time because they need to make sure they're biopsying where there's tumor and not good tissue or else they'll miss the cancer. Well, this, and this is how it's been for years. Every solid tumor, right, takes a lot of time to do it, to wait for the results while you feel your tumor growing. It's very imprecise, uh, both in terms of finding the thing, but also because you can get a poor yield. If your technician who's pulling the biopsy screws it up or you don't get a good yield, or the ultrasound person, there's a lot of variables at play. There's pain, it's invasive, it's extremely inconvenient for the patient, and it costs a lot of money. So a lot of people involved in this. And so the move through sensors is to take away a lot of those pain points, and the science has caught up, and frankly, the ingenuity of people like you to do that. So the big buzzword now are liquid biopsies for cancer. So this is a company, Grail, that's done really well out of the US. It's raised quite a bit of money. And their mission, they're not there yet, but they're working on it, is to have a very simple, high, high, high sensitivity uh, liquid biopsy, or basically a quick blood test, to catch stuff very, very, very early, before you'd ever see a tumor or have a sense of it, for people who could be at high risk. And it kind of overcomes all the things wrong with that. Um, another example, in more just out of medicine, in normal life, um, I've got three children. Uh, it's amazing to see all the rules at our school about who has a gluten allergy and a peanut allergy and can't have lactose and all these rules. Uh, if you've ever had food poisoning, you know when you're traveling in Thailand or somewhere like that, you don't want that to ever happen again. Um, but you don't really have any much to do about it. Well, lots of technologies now finding micro levels of pathogens or other things in a handheld way, all in the consumer markets, uh, well outside of formal medicine. So these ones can detect bacteria in food. Uh, and uh, you take this little thing with you, when you go to the restaurant, you can put the food in and it'll tell you if there's gluten or whatever else you're trying to measure. And a very simple interface, either the face is happy or the face is sad. And it means don't touch it. But of course, there's an app with gradients and stuff behind it. So lots of application there on being proactive. That's the first shift. Next shift, which this word I heard, I think, in every single presentation, so it's pretty obvious what sensors can do, is around the precision of healthcare and medicine. So because healthcare is expensive and we, didn't, we don't have a lot of knowledge when we designed it, it's pretty much a one-size-fits-all model. Everybody kind of gets what works for the average, which means it actually works for nobody. Um, and it's pretty blunt and barbaric. Like, you know, humans are going to look back and say, you used to go in and cut people's organs out when they were sick? Like, what is that? And we still kind of do that. Um, and it's moving to being, because of technology and data, extremely personalized and very, very precise. So, so some examples. So if, if a woman has a tumor in her breast, I think 65% of the time, uh, they have to resect the tumor, do a lumpectomy, remove the tumor. Of course, the surgeon doesn't want to take all the tissue out because then the woman won't have a breast. But it's a challenge because if they try to just get to the tumor and they miss some, there'll be some left over. And about 25% of the time, they miss some of the tumor. It's really hard to do because if you imagine, if you have the image there, you think that's the tumor, you're just going to go in and get it out. But but if the margin of the tumor is from a different angle, it might come to the edge and you've missed it. And now those cells are just going to keep growing and growing and growing. It's an extremely imprecise. And if you think of the numbers of women who have breast cancer, who have surgery, and then have to go back and do it again, or it spreads, it's a bit of a shame that we don't have a better way. Well, we're starting to. So I work at Mars. We work with 300 startups in Canada. Two of our startups are finding better ways in the surgical suite to take the tumor out very, very quickly, check if you got all the margin of the tumor, and then either do more surgery or close it up. This just got published last week. It's a pen. You take out the tumor, it puts a little droplet. The, the, the metabolism of cancer cells, the way they use energy and glucose is different from non-cancer cells. So very quickly, something's happening. They put it in a quick mass spec, 
get a result, and then they can you know, decide if they need to cut more and more. It's getting easier and faster and smaller and cheaper and more precise. Back to the consumer markets out of medicine. I don't know if you guys know anybody who gets real allergies and itchy from clothing or detergent or things like that. Before it was like, oh, just deal with it. There are nanoparticles in the clothing that if they detect a gradient of the irritant, whatever it is, will secrete a little blob of vitamins to ooze to soothe the skin so you never get the itching, right? Micro, micro sensors embedded in clothing and the sensors last for the lifetime of the clothing, including washing it and all that other stuff. Really neat stuff. Okay, so that's the, the second shift, precision. The third shift, which is 100%, I think, all of the pitches I just saw, is the modality or the place or the, the channel through which the patient gets services or care. So again, because we designed medicine at a time when we didn't have a lot of knowledge, so we had to concentrate it, uh, it was, it's very institution-centered. Go to the hospital, go to the clinic, go to the pharmacy. You, patient, you go to the care, even though you're sick and you're vulnerable, and that care might not be in a very convenient location. And parking is really expensive when you go to the care in cities like here. Uh, and, and it's switching to everything but that. You know, I've got a bunch of Ds I'll talk about. Decentralized, democratized, de-physicalized. We're taking all the labor and capital out uh, and, and flipping it to zeros and ones. So this is what healthcare has been built on. I always talk about this. Bricks, people, paper and pens, and fax machines. And those of you who are under 30, you probably don't even know what this is. But believe me, it is running the healthcare system all over the world. We're, we're the only industry that keeps this industry alive. Um, and so this is what's happening to all this labor and capital and physical stuff that's centralized in big buildings. It's, it's all kind of starting to go away, just like every other industry, right? So they talk about, you know, Airbnb is the biggest um, uh, accommodations company in the world. They own no hotels. Uber owns no cars. They're the biggest transportation company, et cetera, et cetera. Who will be the biggest healthcare company in the world that doesn't own a single building or a single doctor? I'm going to guess it's Facebook. So then you'll see the World Economic Forum publish these reports like they did a few years ago or a few weeks ago saying, you know, in 2030, goodbye hospital. This scares the hell out of people who work in healthcare. And we talk about goodbye hospital, hello phone spittal, because care won't just be in your home, it'll be everywhere. And I saw that in your work. So just some, some examples. Well, this has already happened for the sensors that detect physiological or uh, physical things, air, physical stuff, uh, imaging and light and those types of things. All of these devices used to be in a big room, in a big building, in a hospital or in a clinic and now they're kind of attached to some kind of a personal device. And this is really clunky, like in a year, this will look like the iPhone 1 did compared to the iPhone 7. Uh, and then labs are uh, kind of scared to death of this, right? So all of you talked about how, you know, Central Labs looks at this biomarker all the time, and that's certainly the case. And so uh, Eric Topol, if you guys follow him, he's kind of the biggest future thinker. He's a cardiologist from Scripps. Uh, and he's got quotes like this, uh, that laboratory testing is going to be nothing like what it's been for the last 50 years. So if you think of central labs, which is a very efficient and cheap way to do a high volume of blood tests uh, for a very low cost, pennies. So you take the blood wherever, you ship it to the lab, get the result, and then they get the results out on a fax machine. Um, that's now starting to be decentralized in the doctor's office. Right? So sometimes if you're seeing your doctor, they might take your blood right there, but it's still going to go in a car and go to the central lab and get the results and come to you on a fax machine. Uh, starting to be a lot of movement, especially in the U.S., of retail settings for labs, so at the drugstore or something like that. Okay, then your personal device, and soon there will be no phones. We won't have them. It'll be weird that we carry this thing around everywhere. It'll just be wearables, incitables, dermables, audibles, all these ables, just kind of part of our body. Um, one example of this that's got an extreme impact for the world is the ability to detect some of these pathogens in third world or, or very harsh conditions. So think of detecting HIV. You have to get the surface of a, 
of a, of a cell, which is flow cytometry. And when I used a flow cytometer, it was a huge machine at the university, and now it's in this little tiny thing. And this is one of our companies that's doing that. Um, some uh, diagnostics are now not even having an attachment. You just use the light of the phone or the camera. The phone to detect hemoglobin from the light that can flow through the hemoglobin in the blood, uh, pee on a little, a little stick, and get your colorimetry from your phone. And then the other one that really gets me excited is, is just what's going on in your mouth. You know, so we think about blood all the time. Again, you're going to look back and be like, what were those humans doing taking blood out of their body? Because there's so much other biochemical data that isn't as invasive. Uh, and so lots of things you can get from blood. Of course, oxygen and respiration, non-biochemical, but things like ketones and other metabolites. And there's a great company from the Netherlands called Enos, Electronic Nose. They're in Zutphen, if that's how you say it. I visited their labs. Just from the breath, they can start to detect so many diseases with high precision, especially throat cancers where they've started, and tuberculosis. This company started because they were trying to detect the vapors off of paint, right? So back before, paint was really smelly and sicky, so they needed a way to detect them. Now they're all water-based paint, so the company was going to go out of business, and they got into the healthcare business. Glucose, you guys know. Uh, but now, not having to have the glucometer, which is kind of clunky, these continuous monitors are pretty widespread. So lots of decentralization out of big facilities. Next big shift is how frequently you get data, the duration. Again, because everything was centralized and needed expensive resources and people, you only got data every two, three weeks, and I saw that in the, in the rationale for a lot of the pitches today. Um, well, that's pretty bad because a lot happens in between that three-month visit uh, or the six minutes you get in the consult with the clinician. And so it's moving to a completely continuous. And so, you know, we thought when the tricorder was used in Star Trek, that was like complete science fiction, and now it's out, right? So Qualcomm sponsored the, the, the tricorder X Prize, uh, $10 million to any team that could... Um, uh, successfully measure 13 different biomarkers in one handheld device. Some were biochemical, some were biophysical. A Canadian team made it the top five. Um, but the winning team, you know, can basically uh, detect this whole range of human ailments in a one-stop device. Think of the opportunity to disrupt a whole bunch of infrastructure around those diseases. And then getting into the consumer markets, who here has a tattoo? Okay, so now you're gonna to wanna to go get the new tattoo. So, so they have four different paints in the tattoo that can interact and change color when the chemical reaction happens if there's a you know, certain sodium threshold, acid, sugar, and level of exposure to UV light. Right? So think of that invasive way to continuously monitor. I'm not saying this is perfect and in the market now, but it's coming. And you could have like a picture of me if you want on your tattoo, no? Okay, so the next big shift is a bit of kind of the dominant shift of power. Power and choice and control of data, of decision making, of where you're gonna get all these services to the people, people-powered healthcare. So, uh, you know, the idea is we design healthcare that the whole thing, formal medicine, had to be done by the professionals and, and us patients can't handle that kind of truth, so we were left to the side, and now about 80%, they estimate, of what's done today could be self-managed by people in their community and with their families. 80%, that's a lot of opportunity for, for innovation and value to, to shift. So things like people being able to monitor sweat. So yes, you wanna have smart fabrics to check your sweat when you go to the club, but also if you have a disease like cystic fibrosis, or diabetes, there's a lot of data in that sweat and a lot of signal when it goes up that something might be wrong well before things really hit the roof. Band-aids are even smart, for God's sake, right? They'll light up if there's uh, some sense of a pathogen, a bacterial thing, and you guys know when you get a cut, sometimes it goes the wrong way and you catch it way earlier than having to, to get into the ER to get some help. But what I really love about this people-powered health movement is all of us are now hackers of our own health, 
right? The tools are so easy, they're so available, and we're so impatient uh, because it's our health, it's our life, or it's our loved one's life that we can now do something about it. So this guy, Hugo, is famous for a tweet that challenged the CEO of a global medical device company, and it led to this crazy movement of patience. Um, you can do biotech in your garage. Like stuff that in my PhD took me five years to do, you can literally go to an app store for DNA or for a probe, get it and make something in your house. The biggest symbol of this, and I suggest you follow her, is this mom, Dana Anger. So she had a little kid with diabetes. I don't know if you guys know, but when your kid has diabetes, when they start school, uh, it's really hard because you want to monitor their blood a lot, 13, 15 times a day, but they're at school and they're a little too young to do the algorithm in their head of what they should eat relative to their blood glucose. She asked the maker of the monitor, can I get the data on my phone so I can see what's going on? And they said, no. And she said, hell no. So she hacked the thing, wrote the code, made it available to parents all over the world, and everyday moms and dads who know nothing about code are downloading the code and hacking their iPhone or their uh, Samsung or whatever, and basically creating an artificial pancreas using, you know, uh, duct tape and a little bit of code. Um, so uh, they've got a whole movement called We Are Not Waiting. Okay, massive potential. And then the last shift. Oh, sorry, I'll stop there. Um, so put this all together. This amount of change, this is not just little improvement, right? This is what innovation is. Innovation is big, big lifts of value, um, but it's not just about the tech. So, so sensors, I've shown you, could get us there, but the stuff you're all doing and making it and getting it to work and doing the clinical trial and getting the data and getting the manufacturing to work and all that stuff, which is really, really, really hard and 98% fail when they try, uh, is just the fun starting, right? Getting it to patients is the name of the game. If you don't do that, there's no innovation. So this is our innovation math at Mars, right? Invention is not innovation. You have not innovated until it's been adopted to scale, at scale, to a widespread extent. And boy, are there antibodies against adoption of new technology in healthcare. It never ends. This is why I'll be employed for the rest of my life. This is what I do, is I work on these barriers. They don't stop, and it's extremely frustrating. Um, and so if you think of a typical diffusion curve, a Rogers curve of any new technology, right? Early adopters, and then it becomes the majority. Just to get on the curve, to start selling, is, you know, five to ten million dollars, many years, and a lot of failure. You gotta get data, do the trial, get regulated, get reimbursed, get purchased, blah, blah, blah. Really, really hard, that's where 98% die. Then you gotta get adopted, you gotta change the behavior of a clinician, of a nurse, of the patient, of the hospital. All, you have to take away what they used to do for 50 years and bring the new thing. That's not easy. Then it's gotta spread. You have not innovated if you just got bought at one hospital, right? And you gotta get rid of the old thing. So adoption and scale and implementation is a huge area that an inventor of a technology has to build into their plan from day one. They never used to before. So think about these incredible technologies that really changed humanity. This is the typical, this is how long it took for them to get to 50 million users, so that's a pretty good indicator of scale, <laughs> right? So. So Candy Crush, anyone? How many days? Like five? Pokemon Go? An hour and a half? Okay. In any country, in anywhere in the world, from the day that a new medical whatever tech procedure gets published that it works, to the day it becomes wide scale use, 17 years. Okay, we got a problem. <laughs> You guys are coming up with awesome tech that patients need, that has good value, uh, but our system is not designed to absorb it. One big one they bring up is how are we gonna pay for it? Right, so some of you, I saw uh, your, your big dreams that because you're gonna do the test at home, you're gonna save a lot of money in the hospital. Well, the problem is who's gonna pay for that? So imagine you brought your device and it worked and you brought it to the cardiology department at the hospital and you told them, look, spend, I don't know, $5,000 on my new technology, and look, it's gonna save you all this money. You don't have to do the lab, you don't need the cardiologist's time. Is the hospital's budget positive? No. 
But your business case said, but no, but we don't need doctors. We don't need other things. We don't need drugs. The person's going to go back to work and pay taxes. That's good. Money back in the pot. So the net of green minus red is very positive. It's a great business case. But the hospital does not get budget from all these other guys when it makes the hit, right? That's the problem with disruptive innovation in healthcare. The place where the investment is made is not the place where the benefits happen. And the other factor is the time. In 2017, the hospital might even spend the $5,000 because they, they care about health and they want it. But if the benefits accrue over eight years, how does that work? Right? Really, really tough stuff for innovators. The other big one, forget the, the budget, is just the heterogeneity of humans and why what happened in the randomly controlled trial with perfect, sterile, beautiful environment where you had great results and you got approved. So let's say your technology slam dunk showed all this value. Well, guess what has to happen to get that value? The patient has to know something's wrong, get the right diagnosis, adhere to the treatment, uh, the treatment actually has to work in their biology and not mix up with all the other stuff going on in their body. Uh, and then at the end of that, you know, on average, 20 to 30% of theoretical value is actually what we get from technology. This is why our health system doesn't like new technologies. It's an expensive way to try stuff. Uh, the other big one is around focusing just on the tech. So this is a metaphor. So imagine if you're a tractor maker, they're pretty dumb products, right? It's just a tractor, it's analog. Everybody's now doing smart. The car industry went through that. Okay, so it's got some digital data. And then they're connecting it, okay. But you're, you're just starting the dance. The, the key is not just a smart and connected product, but it's gotta be embedded in a system, and then that system in a system of systems, right? So that's kind of what happened with the iPod. Right, when the iPod came out, there were 300 MP3 players on the market. The innovation wasn't the iPad or the user experience. They built an entire system around the technology, and that's where they got competitive advantage. And so manufacturers of dumb products that are extremely innovative, great sensors, like Bayer with their, their glucose meter for kids, uh, are partnering with gaming companies like Nintendo. So attached to the Nintendo DS is the, the glucose meter of Bayer, and now, uh, in exchange for, you know, doing their blood glucose tests, the kids are getting some points and getting their games. They got huge results. Fitbit this week partnered with Dexcom. Dexcom is a glucose sensor company. What do you think the next Fitbit's going to be? When this got announced, Fitbit stock flew up, right? Because just measuring people walking, not good enough. It's got to be embedded in a system of systems. Apple is now talking to the company that can do your blood alcohol. Before you go to the club, just turn it on, and you don't need to have the embarrassing breathalyzer test with, her, with your girlfriend or boyfriend in the car. Okay, so I'm just going to end with this. Has you guys ever heard the line, a canary in a coal mine? Yeah? Right? So the basic idea was people are in the mines, not a lot of oxygen. How do they know if it's risky for the humans in the mine is when the canary stops singing. That's why they take it with them in the morning. That's a pretty good sensor. Don't need no fancy oxygen sensor. Just take a couple birds into the mine. Um, and that also happened with a company from Norway. So this company, which was in the chemical business, got asked, they got given a million dollar contract uh, by another company that said, we need you to detect if we're polluting the ocean. Some pollutant. And so they got all their engineers in a room. They're like, okay, go figure this out. 45 minutes, the engineers were working, and they're thinking about all the things like I saw out there. Uh, and then they brought in a marine biologist because none of them knew anything about oceans. And the marine biologist threw a bunch of clams on the desk. And they were like, WTF? What? We're not eating. Um, and it turns out when the clams detect that, uh, pollutant, they open their shells. So all they had to do now is just figure out a way to see if the clam's shells are opening. That's a lot easier way to build a sensor. And the, you know, the famous quote for this million dollar contract is they saved $999,000. Um, so that just gets to the idea that if you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right, as an innovator. And you really need to make sure you're really understanding and bringing in as many different views to the table. 
And so to inspire you, so I know you guys, you're students, you're trying to work full time, and like, you commit yourself to these crazy contests, um, and I just want to encourage you to keep going. So I'm going to talk about three students, and, and then I'll wrap up, and if we don't have time for questions, we could do it afterwards. So this is Jessica. So she was a fourth year industrial design student at our design school, and for her fourth year project, she wanted to take on the terrible experience of the pap smear. And everybody's like crossing their legs now, right? It's brutal, right? You check for cervical cancer and other things by going to the, uh, the obstetrician and doing all this. She designed a self-swab, very elegant, very personal, uh, same results to detect both cervical cancer, but more importantly, HPV, which is for uh, sexually transmitted diseases, right? Stopped being a student and this is her life's work because there are countries all over the world who will never be able to have a pap smear, and they have women dying of cervical cancer. And that was from being a fourth year student project. Uh, Mofid was in his third year at Waterloo University, developed uh, allergies. I don't know how it is in your countries. In Canada, the wait to get this stupid allergy test is like 12 months, because you have to see the allergist, and there's not many of them. And it's so archaic. They, they put all these different things, coffee and sugar, on your arm. They mark it with a pen, and then you have to come back, and they look if it got red. Like, really? In 2017, he stopped everything and created a company to make a patch that will do it all in 20 minutes, and you buy it at the drugstore. And then finally, Harry. He's my favorite. Harry was a fourth-year student at Waterloo University, and he kept seeing the other students doing a nanotech uh, competition like this one, and he hated school. <laughs> so he went over and he found out they were working on a contact lens that detects blood glucose. And I think I saw that on some people's poster. Quit school and is now the CEO of this company, Medela Health. Quit school. Guess who his only competitor is in the whole world? This really small company called Google. Uh, who's creating the same thing. He's competing with Google and he's going for it. And so I'm really proud of you guys for doing this. It can go in a lot of directions. And thank you for including me in your day today.